This time on Geek Pod Blue. Hey kids, let's find out how movies are made. Warning, station is now code blue. <laughs> special edition of Geek Pod Blue. I am your host, Hugh, and for the very first time in Geek Pod Blue history, I am not alone. I have two people around this table. Would you guys like to introduce yourselves? My name is Brian Hewitt. I'm uh, the director of Hewitt Films. I am Michael Fitzgerald. I run Phoenix Film Studios. And you are also one of the most prolific letter writers in the Geek Pod Blue mailbag, and we love that about you. And we are sitting down today to talk to Brian and Mike uh, about an upcoming project, a film called Transformation, which is going to be having its premiere at the Palace Theater on November 9th at 7 p.m. Uh, we're going to talk about the movie. We're going to talk about the movie industry in general. And uh, I'm going to start this like we start regular Geek Pod shows. Gentlemen, what's got you geeked? What's got me geeked is definitely um, my film. I'm very excited to uh, have that shown at the Palace Theater. Um, Really excited about that. Uh, this will be my second um, feature film that I'm putting out. How about you, Mike? Well, yeah, I, I'm also very excited about transformation and uh, mostly excited to uh, work, to develop a stronger working relation with Hewitt, between Hewitt Films and Fiendish Films. Well, I think that's definitely something we should talk about. I mean, what, give me some of the background on this. How did you guys come together? Oh boy. Um, well, if you're familiar with Jeff Meyer, Je Jeff who Meyer. does events at the Palace Theater, he does the Salt City Horror Fest. He also is doing the upcoming um, Freddy Festival yep. later this month, so check that out. Great uh, Halloween. Um, and one, Jeff's very involved in the local film community, supporting anyone who's making films in the area. Um, often I would get calls from him uh, asking, did I want to come and be part of a project? Uh, I think the earliest one was with a friend of yours, um, uh, chall The Challenge? Uh, Tim Scanlon. Tim Scanlon. I, I came out to be an extra for that. Um, had an enjoyable experience. And then later on, he contacted me about uh, uh, Brian Hewitt, who I had not known at the time, who was making the uh, TV series Rise Up and Fall that aired on Time Warner Cable. Time Warner Cable asked if um, I'd like to help out with that. So I uh, had a small role there, and at that point met Brian Hewitt, uh, kindred spirit, and uh, we've been... Uh, Oh, Jeff Meyer was in that. Yeah, yeah Jeff yeah, Meyer was, Jeff Meyer was in, in that well. Uh, and, you know, we remain contacts and we developed a friendship over the time. But it's only recently that we've really um, sat down and figured out how we could both work together to make movies in a very uh, challenging, uh, just a, making independent films is very challenging. And if you don't have the support... Um, it can be nearly impossible. And so we're here to support one another. Now, how, how does that process work? Because you talk about you know, supporting you know, independent film. Uh, what are those challenges and what is it you're overcoming by working together? Well, um, a lot of the challenges uh, with independent filmmaking and independent filmmakers in the area is, um, I, don't, I don't think, this is just my opinion, I don't think a, um, a lot of us join together. I think a lot of people go their own, they, they do their own route. And I think by us joining um, teams, I think we can reach a bigger audience, we can do better things, we can make uh, production better, look better, and with two people, especially two directors working together, it's, 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 it's going to be a lot smoother than working alone. So this isn't, isn't uh, exactly 
Fiendish Films and uh, Hewitt Films becoming one conglomerate. It's, I'm working on a project, you want to help me with that, and then you're working on a project, you want to come over and help me with that. Yeah, we both want to retain our own identity. We are both going to make our own films. If I support Brian in a film, it's about making his vision happen. If Brian supports me, he knows it's about making my vision happen. Um, when you can overcome the difference in personalities, the difference in egos, and ego is not a bad thing. You have to have an ego to become a filmmaker. It is a monumentous uh, project to achieve. There's so many aspects that it's... You've got to believe in yourself more than anything else. Um, but if you can find somebody who's on the same wavelength who can support you without egos getting in the way, without their vision trying to overcome your vision or the vision of the filmmaker, then there's a lot of potential. Uh, we bring different skill sets. Um, Brian is astounding at uh, finding locations. Um, he's great with working with people and getting them excited about contributing to his work. He brings together a huge cast for any project he works at. He has great relations with a lot of actors in the Syracuse area. So it, it just opens up a lot opportunities for me to work with him. And I just provide whatever I can. Um, you know, I've been doing a lot of promotional work. Um, some of the technical stuff that uh, <clears throat> that I am more familiar with, I can help Brian with in his projects. Um, I did some editing work on transformation. Some? Some, <laughs> well, you know. If, if I look at your uh, Facebook post, it seems like you've been editing for uh, uh, about a year and a half now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but it, the important thing, a year ago, Brian came, I spoke to Brian, and Brian was facing some challenges on completing the film. And this is, this is well known. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the film was shot. Completed. A couple, a couple yeah. years ago, yeah. people had been waiting on it. Um, there was some work that needed to be done. Um, Brian was open to suggestions, and he tr we had gotten to the point where he trusted me with his with his baby. I mean, it's yeah. you know, it's which doesn't happen normally. I would never hand it, hand over anything to anyone. I I I used, I'm not <laughs> even I don't even hand out my scripts to anyone. Like a lot of the times when I um, make like when I rise up and fall and transformation. I only gave people who were acting in the film their part. That's it. They okay. didn't. They didn't get to see anything else of the script. And the only reason why I did did that is because a long, well, a while ago, a friend of mine uh, had some auditions, and um, he gave the people the whole script, and they went out and put it on, put it out there, told people the end of the story and things like that. So I, I was like always nervous about that. So for me to actually give. My all my video and all everything to somebody was challenging, but um, I believe in Mike, and that's why I was just like, I and I trust him, so I was just like, yeah, let's get it done. Let's let's get it done. I would think that also, and this is me being a a layman here, um, giving people only their parts. Does that lend itself to more um, genuine reactions from oh, the actors? Good, good question. Um. Sometimes, yes. Um, a lot of the times what I do, uh, they see the script, and I'm not, like, when I work with the actors and actresses, I don't, I don't, like, I'm not a stickler on the script. I don't, like, have to say, I don't want it to be word for word, because that's what makes it uh, sound uh, independent and stiff. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And I, I, I want, I want them to, to become the character. I want them to, I want them to, if they don't like a line or they don't feel comfortable about it, I'd like them to change it. I want their feedback. I, that's why I like to work with them um, more than it's just me, all me, all about me. I don't like that. I, I want the person to be comfortable. I want the person to act uh, the way they want to.
Also, if an it does benefit an actor in the sense that if they know the outcome of their individual character's actions in a scene, they it might color their performance. Yeah. Like, I know where this is going to end. Like, I know where where this turns, and they have that in their mind. It is possible that it can, you know, affect... Also, with the improvisational aspect, um, it can it can affect their performances. So there are advantages to keeping actors in the dark of the overall scope of the story. Plus, when they come to see the film, they'll be ex- they'll they'll they get a surprise. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, I had no idea what this was all about. Oh well, it, the. <laughs> The same thing happened for me when I was working with you on Rise Up and Fall. Yep, that's right. I didn't understand. I thought I was there for a couple of days that I had a the relatively small part. And then when I saw Rise Up and Fall, it's like I didn't realize the scope, the arc of my character's story, because these things are shot out of sequence. Yeah. And I, I was impressed. I was blown away. I didn't think I had such a... For me, it seemed like such a large large role and I think not knowing how my scenes affected the overall storyline I might have played it different Mm. and um, I'm glad Brian did that but that's his choice that is his choice to make yeah it sounds like you guys are definitely working on a non-competitive collaborative process I mean yes I I don't know that uh I don't have enough experience with enough local independent filmmakers to know that it, this is that far outside the norm, but it certainly seems to me if I wanted to get stuff done, this is the way you go about doing it. I, it, it there's it, nothing... Yeah. Yes. There is nothing... I'm not going to come down on any anyone for being no, competitive. Because you may see... You may see that there are limited resources or limited limited number of actors that you are comfortable with that you can call upon. So there will be competition for these things. Um, You're going to want to be the first one to use a location. You're going to want to be the first one who puts an actor in the spotlight. You're going to want to be the one who gets that commitment when you need an actor in a larger role. Um, And that's completely understandable. But we we are... trying to do something more inclusive and it takes an army i mean oh yeah this is the correct me if i'm wrong i can't think of any other artistic medium that relies on such a group collaboration a writer needs a pen a a painter needs a brush a photographer needs a camera we need an army Mm mm-hmm I agree. I agree. I mean, for trans- for transformation alone, there's what? Uh, about 90 people were in it, I'd say? Easily. Yeah. At least. In acting roles or behind the scenes as well? Mostly in acting roles. Well, behind the scenes is mostly me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, with independent, with independent filmmakers, a lot of the times we're doing everything as far as special effects and everything else that goes into it. Most of the time. I was lucky to have a special effects artist in, come in for transformation, uh, a guy by the name of Jim Wallen, and he did a fantastic job on the uh, on what he did in the film, and I definitely want to throw out a, a huge thank you to him. Um, that helped out a lot. I mean, just the effect alone was just really neat. I mean, I'm good with special effects makeup, I'm good with making special effects, but sometimes I just need the help. and. Uh, <laughs> It was it was really good to bring him in on that. Well, I, that's that's definitely a complex process. Um, I think Mike knows. I mean, we've talked about it. Uh, my oldest daughter does special effects makeup. And oh, great! When I, I watch when she's doing just something simple, I'm just kind of blown away by I, how you the the I don't want to say it. The order you have to start with colors from light to dark and all of that stuff. I mean, it's it's a lot more. People think, hey, throw some. You know, fake skin on there and put some red blood on there. It's way more complex. It's an art. Yeah, it's an art. It's something you have to have an eye for. Um, Like in painting, Um, you can you know the technical process to achieve your goal, but if you don't have the artistic component or a vision or a, a sense of color and design, 
that's what separates the good work from the utilitarian work. No, I definitely agree. I uh, one of my favorite sayings is "those who can't podcast about it." Mm. <laughs> um, I, I want to ask you, and I brought this up before we started recording. Um, you've got a bunch of credits on IMDb. Uh, there were uh, se- seven acting credits, and I'm not sure if that's actually more because IMDb isn't always correct. And I noticed that you kind of get, there seemed to be like a transition from acting to directing. And you said that you still kind of do both. Uh, but what is what is that like? Is is there a, a line between the two? Did you know the first time you, you acted in something that what you wanted to do was direct eventually? Um, I started. I've started acting in 2005. This, this is actually a strange story. Um, my little brother came to me with a little with a little digital camera, and we he taped me doing some funny stuff. And uh, I actually started with doing little comedy skits. This was even before YouTube was out, and I can't remember the name of the site, but we put it on the internet, and people loved it. And uh, all I heard was just stuff about it. And so I was like, oh, okay, cool. Let's see what I can do. So um, I, I, I got excited about that because I was like, wow, people can see me online, see my talent. I was like, neat, okay. I said, my brother just opened up a, a can of worms here. <laughs> so I started writing, and I came up with Rise Up and Fall, a crime drama, and the script was so big that I had to break it down into seven uh, television series and a feature film. And then I continued on from there. But to get back to your question, um, acting, I love acting. Um, what I love most about acting is I show up, I do my thing, and I'm gone. I don't have to worry about anything else. That's what I love about acting. But um, directing, um, I, I, I feel as though I, I want to have certain... Um, stories that are that I've written and um, I want to I want to be able to show them and um, directing's just a different type of um, it it goes hand in hand with uh, with with acting with for me at least um, so it's like it's it, it's hard to explain it's um, well a lot of your stories are very personal to you without revealing any of, of any of your own personal history but we've yeah. had conversations rise up and fall has aspects of it that you drew upon experiences from your own life transformation has the same thing so we're really hoping something horrible happens to brian hewitt in the next year so he's inspired for his next script no, <laughs> no i've had enough i've had enough horrible events no. but um yeah i mean directing i i enjoy directing and um, it, it's 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 fun to see to bring the acting out of other people. I enjoy doing that, and um, the acting aspect of it, I just like I said before, I I love acting. It's fun, um, and uh, I enjoy doing it. Directing is just another way of is just another tool for me, I guess. How about you, Mike? What are your thoughts on that? Well. Uh, yeah, I appreciate the opportunities that Brian has given me to act. I, I don't consider myself a very good actor. I, for, fortunately, he's been able to, and other people that I've worked with have gotten, hopefully have gotten a performance they're happy with from me. Um, acting was usually just a, uh, oh, this gives me an opportunity to be on someone's set and see what they do and how they do this. So taking notes. It's a it's an oppor- <laughs> yeah, it's an opportunity for an education. Um, I think one of the first appeals of uh, of directing is I enjoyed telling stories and back in my youth, talk about something geeky, um, role playing games. Of, of, if you're the dungeon master or the game master, you are the director. You decide when events occur, you put the setting, you put the story into place. Unfortunately, if you've uh, ever, have you DM'd before? I have not DM'd. Oh, okay. Playing. Well, one of the worst things that could possibly happen to a DM is when your players decide to tank your entire story that you spent so much time working on by doing something incredibly stupid, and then you throw it, you lose your whole story. Well, in directing a film, well, the players, the actors, 
they don't have any choice in what they get to do. <laughs> See what you're saying. Right. I, I, I enjoy that control. I can tell the story I want in film, and the players have to follow my script. Hmm. So, uh, thanks to Gary Gygax for, uh, for interesting, me, interesting me in uh, film direction. Now I know which one of you is more likely to take over the world. It's definitely Mike. <laughs> <laughs> now, so you actually just answered my next question, Mike. So I'm going to throw this at you, Brian. Okay. What part of this process do you like best? And not just directing, but the, the process of making a film from start to finish. What, what's your favorite part? And what's the part that when you get to it, you dread it, but you know it has to be done? Editing. <laughs> that's, 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 that's the for that question. What I like most... Um, is, um, is, is filming with the people, um, interacting with them, having fun on the, on the set. Um, another one of my favorite things is when I see it being put together and the story and the music and the, it's, it, it, it's, it's very satisfying. Um, it's kind of weird because if you show up on a set and you watch what's going on, you're like, this is kind of boring. You're kind of bored with it, with with some of the things that are going on, because you don't understand that when it's finished, it's going to look. It's going to look when it's done. It looks totally different from what was going on at the time, and it, it's it's. They can't see the camera's perspective. Yeah, it's very it's very it's very rewarding. Um, so yeah, that's my favorite thing is to to just be with the actors and uh, have fun making a project of mine that I wrote come to life. Is is is. Honestly, flattering. It's 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 amazing to see it get done, and I, that's my favorite part of it. Um, the thing I dread, editing. Well, that's why our partnership works so well. I enjoy editing. I, if I didn't have a project to be working on or a film of my own, I would often find an existing film and re-edit it. Really? Yeah. Um, I've actually uh, helped other filmmakers to, um, you know, polish, polish their films, um, and just as a way of supporting them. Horribly, sometimes before getting their permission, but I've been very fortunate <laughs> in the sense that they were happy. They were happy with what I've done. And I, it's just something I just love doing because there's so many, so much you can do in editing to shape the story. You can often change the story. You don't. Brian, when he asked me to work on transformation, had so much. I had I worked from his raw footage, and he had so much coverage that there were a lot of options that I had. Some he had even forgotten about. Because sometimes you, you shoot and you think, all right, well, that didn't work. I'm not going to include that. Um, actually, some of the stuff he shot actually saved us because we got to certain parts. And it's like, well, we don't have something to bridge this scene. Or we don't have, we never got the scene that explains how this occurs. And I'll be going through Brian's footage and I'll, I'll go, yeah, Brian, well, what if we, do, what if we use this? Or... What if we use that? Um, I did shoot a lot of footage. You do show. Well, that's and that's. <laughs> I, I well, how long do. is the extended cut of this film? Oh no! Oh. This is this is. <laughs> With everything thrown in. No, oh this is God. this is the this is his original cut came in at two hours, and the final cut that I the honor of working on also comes in at two hours. But um, there's there's um, a number a lot of. I'm going to say maybe like I might have used 20% different footage than you had in your in my original all the key yeah. scenes are there are, are there yeah but you know the way the way you did uh, the one scene I won't say exactly, yeah but, oh yeah but the way you, the way you put it on um, the side there you know, yeah, oh yeah the yeah 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 um, Cut down some of the stuff. Yeah. Cut down some of the scenes, but it but it came out really neat. And not to get and to make it clear that everything that I did editing work on the film um, has gone gone through Brian. As I said, I'm yeah. here to support 
his vision. I, he has the final say. And I might have arguments, which are constructive, for why this should be done this way, why I think this should be done that way. And either he agrees with it, and it goes in, or he disagrees with it, and it comes out. And there's no, for me, there's no ego on the line. I am here to support him. I, I actually, you know, it, it was kind of neat, you know. Mike comes over, shows me the f film. I feel like George Lucas, and I just sit there, and uh, <laughs> and I say, nope, yes, change that, yep, okay. And that's well, we're so wor used to working on everything on our own and making all the decisions, and not having that second set of eyes. I mean, there's a reason that in Hollywood you have these individual roles, and you benefit by working with other people. You benefit by considering other opinions. I think the work that comes out of both of us going forward is just going to be much better because of it. Yeah. Well, I think that everybody's going to be excited to see what that looks like, and that's going to bring us to what we actually came here to talk about today, and that is uh, Transformation, the movie. Now, I, I want to ask you, Brian, where, what's the inspiration for this? Give us a, a synopsis, and then... Tell us what the inspiration, like where this little uh, nugget of story germinated in your brain and became what it is now. Okay. Um, well, um, the the story itself, it sort of just uh, I uh, I wanted to write. Um, I I like doing all sides of different genres of film, and I wanted to write um, a psychological thriller slash horror film. And, um, I didn't want it to be too gory, but, um, I wanted it to be to the point, um, of what I wanted to do. The, it, 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 it is hard to explain. I will, t yeah. I will tell <laughs> yeah. you, <laughs> yeah. I will tell you when I first agreed to work on this edit with Brian, I looked at the film and I said, I can't explain it to my, I, I, I could not explain it to myself. It took me a while to get wrapped my head around what he was saying. Yeah, it was... Uh, Transformation is a very dark film. It's um, Where it came from, that I don't know. Um, I was just... I, I sat down one day and I was thinking, and I was like, I want to do something dark. Um, I, actually, I actually brought uh, the this, this, this storyline to a friend of mine, and he was like, no, 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 people aren't ready for that. And I was, wow. yeah, and I was like, uh, he, he was just like, I don't think you should go there. And I was like, well, I'm going to do it. And I, I'm, I'm going to do it. But um, um, I started writing it, I'd say, around, right around the time I started finishing Rise Up and Fall, uh, filming-wise. So I started writing it. And I had kind of a writer's block for about a month. And um, then I just sat down. And normally what I do when I write is I listen to classical music and it just came to me and I just went and I finished the script within oh god two three days yeah. and it was 100 pages or so I don't know how many pages really um, but um, the uh, the film itself uh, it, uh, it has and it doesn't have anything to do personally with like me it's not like based on anything that's um really happened to me or anything like that but um i started studying uh serial killers and i studied each and every single one of them and um i i, I did a lot of research on on it and uh i took a lot bits and pieces from them and their childhood and their background and i added that into it and um that's that's what basically came down to it. I mean, the the story itself of transformation. It, I mean, basically, it's about a um, it's about a guy. He had a terrible childhood um, with his uh, with his father, and um, then he had growing up. He had problems with re, uh, relationships, and um, he was he was alone. And um, a friend of his shows up <laughs> and uh, gives him some advice. And uh, it's uh, it, it goes from there, um, with as far as him being a killer. But the police get involved, and they the police bring in a New York City uh, detective, a profiler, 
to hunt down the killer. And that's basically the story of the film. Well, we were talking before we started recording how um, we've all had dark times in our past. Yes. We've all had times where we've been broken, we had to rebuild ourselves, and we had to find the right direction for us. I think that the heart of transformation is, like you said, what's that, what if the little voice in our ear didn't give us the correct advice, the correct advice, (laughs) the right direction? What if we gave into that anger we felt? What if we gave into that pain we felt? Um, And I think that is, has a lot to do with the lead character character's path. Yeah, so it's, yeah exactly. And, and the lead character in this, it sounds like it's definitely the killer and, and not the other correct. people brought in. Oh, that's interesting, because it's usually, while they're they're prominent, it's usually the... Even if it's not meant to be the story of the, the, the police or whoever's following it, it seems like these kind of movies always are their story, with the killer just putting in the best performance. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I perfectly... That's a good say, point. Yeah, yeah something, seven... Yeah, seven, or even Silence of the Lambs. Silence you know? of the Lambs, yeah. You know, it's, that's usually how it goes. Usually someone sends you down the wrong path. Usually, you if you've made... David makes more than an error in judgment, but as I said, when we're broken, when we're hurt, when we're in pain, there's that voice, and it, send, and it just sends you in the wrong wrong direction. And I think... You're, as you said before, you see, if you research serial killers, there was someone who affected them. There was someone they had a strong relation with. It could be a family member, could have been a, you know someone they loved, a wife, a girlfriend, what have you. That was the source of that. But there was some other influence that affected them. And this is David's story of hearing the wrong voice, getting the wrong message, and the path it brings him down. It's a fict- fictional character. David's a fictional character. It's all it's all fiction, this, this film. It's not based on any uh, real-life serial killer. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I noticed in the synopsis I've read of the film, uh, they talk about the, the profiler brought in from New York City, um, something about getting too close to the darkness or something along those lines. I, what's, what's that about? <laughs> He, his character is um, uh, played by Jack Gargaro, who recently passed away, and um, he, um, his character is a profiler from New York City, and he gets, he's actually, the, what's he doing is he actually sort of like, like, becomes into the reality of, he comes into the reality of these killers. He sort of just, so, through his dreams... Um, doesn't see who they are, but has a relationship with the killers through dreams. He's been touched by the the dark influences that uh, that hunting these killers down over the years, and he makes makes decisions that uh, he may not have made if he hadn't had that, had those experiences. The, uh, the synopsis kind of gave me... He's, like, like, literally almost as broken in his own way as Correct. David is. Yeah. The synopsis kind of gave me, like, a Millennium vibe. Is that kind of what you're going for? Millennium? Uh, I'm not familiar with it. Well, I... I you know David's that. philosophy is... Uh, and his ultimate goal does lead... Is pointing him in towards his own personal apocalypse that will, yeah. and then through his actions affects and harms many other people. I agree. Definitely. Now, when we sit down and see this, is there anything that you want people to be thinking about? Anything you want them? You want them to come in with a blank slate? Yes. Be prepared to be wowed, be blown away? I, I want them to just, yeah, I want them to watch this and definitely, it, it's a it's a different type of serial killer film. It's it's not your typical. It's it's not your typical. Like you said before, normally it's the cops. You, they're, 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 the film's concentrating, like in uh, Red Dragon. You, know, you pretty much just see the cop um, and what he's doing. This actually shows both sides. 
of uh, the police and hunting him and the killer and what's affecting the killer. And it's sort of blended together and you get to see both sides, which you don't normally see. Yeah, I can mean, the only, the only uh, film or TV show I can think of in recent memory that actually did a fairly good job of that was Hannibal. Which you're which a fan of, which I'm a fan, the yeah. Best TV shows of all time. Uh, yeah, I definitely loved Hannibal. I'm, I'm a huge fan of Hannibal, the series and the films, but the series I was really blown away, really blown away. Which is weird because with Rise Up and Fall, I was a huge, my other film was a crime drama, I was a huge fan of The Sopranos. So I don't know if that somewhere like has anything to do with how I wrote both these films. I'm not sure. But um, Well, one of the key differences you'll find that I hope you'll find in Transformation is why you are following both sides of the story. It's not in the case where information is revealed to you that is not revealed to one of the other characters. Um, both si sides remain blind. So you're not ruined by seeing actions that David takes or actions that Jack takes the actor sorry uh, Nardello, Nardello. 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 Yeah. that takes where you're going to then know what happens next yeah you definitely don't see it coming you don't know what happens <laughs> David will take an action you do still fully well knowing that you don't know how this is going to affect Nardello Nardello takes an action you don't know how this is going to affect David um, in a lot of, and one of the things is, um, they are, they are separate, they are separate stories that, that come together. Um, so you're actually seeing, seeing two stories and it's not till the very end do the, 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 the two worlds collide. Actually, it reminds me in certain ways of Wrath of Khan where, you never saw Khan in the same exact scene with Kirk. They're yeah. always they're always separate. Now I know that there's a, some kind of promotion that you've been doing called the Transformation Treasure Hunt. Yep. Saw it on Facebook. Uh, wanted you to tell us a little of what that's about. Okay. Um, I I was sitting I was sitting uh, one night and I do a lot of uh, thinking at night um, in the dark hours <laughs> and. Uh, I was like, why not do something fun with the film that I've never seen done before as far as independent filmmaking in this area. So I decided to do a treasure hunt. And what the treasure hunt is, is I have some props that were seen in the film. And um, they're going to go into a, uh, a box and uh, some other items. I'm going to have a DVD of my first film in there and um, a signed DVD. And I'm going to have uh, another... Uh, printed up piece of paper so they have two free access to the film transformation. Basically, I'm going to put all this into a little package and I'm going to hide it somewhere in central New York. And I'm going to give out three clues and they have to follow these clues to find the, 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 the box. Um, the three clues that I'm giving them are the same clues that the police get in the movie to hunt the killer. The killer gives some clues to the police. He's taunting the police. So he gives some clues to try to catch him. So you get a chance to hunt for David. The, you get a chance yeah. to hunt to hunt the killer. Before, before you see the film. And, wow, uh, that, is, that is really clever. Yeah, so they get to go to the locations once they figure out what they are and see the location, where it was filmed, and uh, they will find a clue there. They will find a clue. I'm going to probably have it on a piece of paper or something, hidden. And they will pull it, they, they'll find it, they'll see this is the second clue. And then they can find the next clue. And then that will lead them to the box. It kind of makes the viewer part of the movie process. Yep, absolutely. That, that is such a great idea. Thank you. Now, I have one last question for you guys, but it's not related to the movie. It's a filmmaking question, so I'm going to table that for just a second. And I want to know what else that you want to say about Transformation before its premiere on November 9th at the Palace Theater. Mike? Well, I, 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 I think it's important that you let everyone know who the film is dedicated to. Definitely. Um, the, 
The film is dedicated to my father, who just passed away in uh, 2015, and is also dedicated to Jack Gargaro, who is a huge part of this film, a very huge part he of is, this film. He, is, he was the star of the film. He was the star of the film. He was my producer and a very close friend. And um, this is uh, his last film. And um, it's very hard. It's very hard for me. It's heartbreaking that yeah. he is not going to be there. Yes. And I, 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 we get overwhelmed with it pretty easily. Um, I was lucky enough. To, he saw most of it. I was luck, He saw the film. But he didn't see this version of it, unfortunately. He's been such a big part of Hewitt Films and has been always supported and pushed. And always Liter pushed me, literally. <laughs> literally, yeah. Oh, yeah. Literally. Pushing Brian because he believed in Brian. And, um, you know, he was invaluable. I mean,. I, uh, you know, we can only, um, we can only hope to do justice to him and, you know, hopefully he would be proud of what Brian's done and what he, what he, oh, he, what everybody sees. He's proud. Yeah. I, I just say it'd be hard to imagine anyone would with the amount of passion I see on the other side of that table. Mm. I mean, it's, it's incredible. Um, so I'm going to ask you the question I okay. have thought about this quite a lot and I was like I've never had the opportunity to have two directors on the other side of the table from me so if you could if you could do this there are no rules no limits what established horror movie franchise has an imaginative play a sandbox that you would love to play in if you could have the reins hmm hmm you know something with that, that would be considered a franchise that could potentially have a sequel which one do you think would be the most fun to be involved in? I acting or directing? Let's say directing. Directing. So you, you have full control of the establishment thus. Oh, wow. Um there's so many to choose from, but uh me personally, I would love to redo The Shining. I would love to redo The Shining. That would be a great film to not that I would ever get a performance like Jack Nicholson. <laughs> No way, but I would love to... That would be a great film to do. Definitely. For me. The Shining would be mine. Yeah. How about you, Mike? I would... I've always been a fan of the Friday the 13th films. I've always been a fan of Jason Voorhees. But given that, I've always had an idea for... For a... Um, a combination film, which I'm really always surprised that no one's done, because we had Freddy vs. Jason. I always thought and would love to do Warlock vs. Wishmaster. That's interesting. Hmm. That's really interesting. Not not one I would have expected. Yeah, well, they are. They have similarities in terms of their their abilities and, and their overall goals, and I could imagine them coming into conflict. Um, and they both have their own unique set of rules and how those would play against each of them. Um, I would love, I would love to see it. I, I would love to see it with the original actors in that roles, in those roles. Is Julian Sands still acting? I don't unfortunately know. And Andrew Duroff, I cannot pronounce his name, but I would definitely would, would want both of them, but... I think it could be a very well done story that would be, uh, it would be complicated in some ways because, as I said, both have their own set of roles, but I think it could be a lot of fun. It could be, could be something spectacular. See, now that you asked me that, I got a bazillion, uh, yeah, now I got a bazillion, well, now I'm like, you know, when you know? I put this, to, this question together, I was actually made a bet with myself that I knew, I figured at least one of you would answer Hellraiser. Ah, you know, I was thinking that too at the same time. Hellraiser would be... Oh, I'd rather see Clive get it back. I, I, I'm dying for Clive Barker. I believe the rights are returning to him soon. Well, I mean, they still have a, a finished movie they haven't released, so I mean, I don't, I don't know how the rights effect, are affected by that because every time they put a movie out, yeah. it kind of renews it. And I know that, um, what's it called? Um, 
I can't remember the name. I was just looking up for the uh, looking the uh, release date. There's still no release date, but there is a finished Hellraiser movie that has not been released yet. Really, I didn't yeah. know. I didn't know that. That'd, yeah, and a different again, be interesting. a different person playing Pinhead, not the other actor they got last time. They have somebody new. Uh, apparently, he's actually a, a stage actor. Mm. People have said he actually did a really good job. Hmm. I mean, it's not it's not Doug Bradley. It sucks that it's not Doug Bradley, but this guy did a really good <coughs> job with it. Apparently, uh, but nobody really knows why it hasn't been released. There must be something going on behind the scenes. Hmm. Uh, I just find that a very imaginative world, a place that oh, you can yeah. do just about oh, anything. That would be fun. To, yeah, that would be fun. Yeah, now that you say that. I mean, but there, I mean, a lot of the remakes that I've seen, I, I wasn't really impressed. Like, like perfect example is Fright Night 2, or, or Fright Night. I was not impressed with the new, with, with, with that film. Uh, they could have did, did it a, a lot better job with that. I wasn't impressed with that. The Friday the 13th, though, I did enjoy. I did like that remake. Um, it almost, you know, it didn't feel like a remake. It, it felt it, yeah, like it could have just been another, another part movie. of the series. Yeah, and, and I think those usually are the best remakes, the ones that don't put an explanation point on it, saying, "Hey, we're doing things different and edgy." It's yeah. just another movie that draws on the same ideas that made the other ones successful. And I, and I hung out with Derek Mears also. I hung out with him at uh, Scaricon a couple years back, and and couldn't believe how big he was for one <laughs> for two he was just a real nice guy which really was dip, difficult to come over but uh i mean yeah i mean i i thought that was a great that was a great remake and the it remake i i really loved i i have to, I, I was really happy with that remake too i have not seen it yet oh my god we my wife and i have a, a set of free movie passes we've had to, since christmas and it's that hard for us to get to the movies. And we were going to try to go see a matinee of it, but the movie is so long, when you tack at least 30 minutes of previews on, and it doesn't start till like, I think, 12.30, 12.45 at all the matinees, we can't get back in time to get my daughter off the bus from school. Uh, yeah, dude, you know, it, it's, it's amazing. It, it was a great... It, it was, they really did a good job. What I, what I, I mean, Pennywise was good, but what made that film, honestly, was the kids. Yeah. Yeah. The kids did a, a performance that was just like really, really, really like I was just like really impressed with their performances, especially the girl who played uh, Beverly Marsh. I was just like blown away by the by her acting. It was just I was like wow. I, I couldn't wait to see her act more in the film. I was really impressed with her. Definitely. We w- rewatched the original um, just before it, re- it released, uh, kind of getting ourselves ready for it and. I mean, other than some overacting from Annette O'Toole, which kind of was jarring to me after watching her on um, Smallville for years, you know, where she was a good actress, there was some overacting scenes in there where she just got, oh, you know, all upset about stuff and it seemed silly. It was totally like, you know, 80s, 90s TV Oh, stuff. definitely, yeah. Um, but, I mean, I felt it held up. It, it's, it's really tough to imagine somebody doing a better job than Tim Curry, but from what I hear, uh, he has a Bill Skarsgård, I believe mm-hmm. it is. Yeah. Uh, I'm just hoping that they take a, a learn a lesson from the original one because if you are going to have a final show showdown with the big bad guy, I, I don't care that it was a stupid spider in the original. The fact that you paid money to have Tim Curry be in your movie and then he's not in the final big confrontation scene I agree. is ridiculous. I agree. They 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 should they should. I would have rather them fight the clown again. Yes, I agree. Let him chew up that cave scenery uh, yeah. like he does. Yep. And it would have been much better. Uh, I mean, I don't want to talk too much about other films, but I mean, <laughs> the transformation thing, we're done. We can just talk now. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Sure. I mean, if there's anything you guys want to talk about or throw out there. Well, um, we are, as I said, we, and I mentioned before the interview, um, we are looking, we have a partnership. We are working, looking to work with more people, more organizations like your own develop more partnerships um we have another we have another uh we're gonna be doing a short film in october well it is october we're gonna be doing october first today the first short in an an anthology later this month um brian will be directing that it's titled uh mr giggles mr giggles (laughs) we're actually going to be shooting the weekend of halloween weekend before halloween at a location that is so generously provided for us by Jason Howard of Graveyard Fresh. Please look him up online. Um, he runs a uh, hearse uh, business. Well, <laughs> it's, like a, it's like a limo service. Yeah, but it's a um, hearse. 
you know, it's better to ride in front than end up in the back, get there alive. <laughs> so uh, please support him. He, he he's We consider him a good friend and one of our partners. Um, we want to continue uh, building a relationship and partner with GeekPod. We are also partnering with um, um, one of your uh, frequent uh, contributors to the Web question, Cam Webcam Nick. Nick. Webcam who's going to do right. videography at our event, so we very much thank him. Yes, very much. Um, we've got to mention that the premiere, we're going all out for the premiere. We are going to have a lot of our partners there. There's we're going to be a mini con going on before the show. Nice. Um, we, just yeah. ne we just invited Geek Pod to be there because we want them there. Um, we have an artist who is going to be doing some uh, posters and some new flyers for us, James P. McCampbell, a very talented local artist who we're partnering with. Um, during the making of Transformation, we got a lot of help from uh, various filmmakers from the Utica area, like Sean Ubley from e &H Productions, who is going to be working with us in our, in our anthology and directing a segment. We got help from Matt Peters and Matt Angel Films. He brought in his cast. Um, Sean Ubley provided a lot of costumes. They're a lot, yeah. Oh, they look great. They, well, they're 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 not even costumes. They're they're, yeah, they're, they're still, authentic. Yeah, really they're authentic big. police and SWAT uniforms that added a lot of production value to the film. Mm -hmm. And it's like we said before, working together, being willing to let other people in and then supporting them, which we want to do. I mean, please check out um, e &H Productions. Please check out Mad, Mad Angel, Angel Films. Films. Mad Angel Films is going to be at the event with their films. He's going to be selling some DVDs and other things. Yeah. We're, um, trying, we're trying to get more well, who, people. Who uh, Matt Flint. Matt Flint, He's another an artist. Who yeah. you're familiar, familiar with, with, a very that. talented local artist, is going to be set up at the show as well. I think we're going to probably have some more announcements to make. I'm Hopefully, we want to we want to get vent we got to want to get more vendors. So if you guys are interested, if someone's we, interested, let me know. We want we know what it's like to be an independent artist. We need to use whatever we have to give it. We want to share the advantages that we have. We have a venue. Why can't we share that? And that's what we're trying. Why to can't do. we give other people Why can't we give other people opportunities like? At the last premiere, Rise Up and Fall, I, I did the videography. Why can't we can't ask a talented individual like Webcam Nick to do that? Why can't we? We have you have to release some control or perceive control to let someone else come in. Let someone else with a different skill set. Let someone else with a different point of view come in, and it enriches it. Mm -hmm. I in agree. a different audience as well, who will reach people that you might not reach through your normal channels. Yeah, true. Yeah. I mean, that's why we're so glad to be here with you and GeekPod. Um, but yeah, we're just looking for for any opportunities. Not and they're not just for ourselves. It's for other people. Because and Brian's always said, if we're gonna if we're gonna come up, we're gonna come up together. I always we, say that. We, that's one of my main things. It, 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 nice. it, it, if it I make freedom. it, we all make it. We if. We're not. That's the only way we're going to succeed if we do it together. Now imagine if the rest of the world actually took this advice from a, a couple guys making horror films. <laughs> that's that's true. Think? That's true. Uh, well, do you guys have anything else to say in closing? I, I mean, well, we come bearing gifts. Yeah, uh, we do. Uh, that's right. Yes, that's right. I, we did, I, as I said, if I, 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 I've always enjoyed this podcast. But you know what? I'm not seeing any free. And I'm turning like I'm looking at somebody, which is, which, is <laughs> not at, which is not good at an audio medium. I don't think this show has enough giveaways. Well, that's partly because I don't make any money on this show, <laughs> so I can't actually buy stuff to give away. Yeah. Well, now we have stuff to give away. I have so. some leftovers in my fridge, if anyone's interested. <laughs> All right. So the first thing, and we're going to let you decide how whatever contest or promotions, whatever you want to run. Uh, the first thing we are... And I, I am actually pointing. You're holding, yeah. I'm right. holding something holding in front it, of the yeah. microphone like it was a camera. Uh, the first <laughs> thing we're going to give you to share with your audience, however you deem fit, is Brian Hewitt's original TV series and feature film, 
Rise Up and Fall. This is the special crime scene edition. I like that. Yeah. There's some actual crime scene tape inside this case. <laughs> I won't I won't uh, comment on where or under what conditions that I got the crime scene tape, but you know, okay. Um, <laughs> second, we also have the Hewitt Films short film Locked In. Oh, directed by Anwar Armstrong. Directed, actually. written by yourself. And my film written, but directed by Before we friend. forget, before we forget, another person who's been very, very important to the film and is a very talented actor, Wayne, and very supportive, Wayne W. Johnson. Wayne W. Johnson. He was in Rise Up and Fall. Trans- Brian. Yes. He was in Transformation. Yes. Oh, he, a trans- huge role for Transformation. Huge role. Uh, he also has a role in Locked In as well. Oh, he did great in that movie. Interesting yeah. uh, story about Wayne. Uh, met him at a convention not too long ago. Awesome guy. Oh, yeah. Absolutely awesome guy. Great interview. Would love to watch his movie, but my wife and I watch horror movies together. And after his description of one of the first scenes, she's like, I'm not watching that. Which one, what, what film did he mention? Was uh, it Night of Something Strange? Night of Something uh, Strange. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you met him at uh, Syracuse Zombie Con. Yes. And um, Fiendish Films has finally got it around to release him that episode of The I Fiends this morning. this morning. I, I watched, watched the last With the night. interviews with, uh, we got interviews with Dwayne W. Johnson about his zombie films portraying Cornelius in Night of Something Strange. We've got uh, Mark Joseph Peake from Mad Angel Films with uh, talking about his zombie film, Half Dead. We've got Greta. Uh, I cannot pronounce her last name. Apologize. Sorry, Greta. You can hit me at the next show. Uh, who's been in um, Big Put versus Zombies. And Transformation. Transformation. Um, Empire State of the Dead, also with Wayne Johnson. And also in our next gift... E.N.H. Productions, Sean Ubley's Hellbound zombie film. I, I talk more about Wayne's character and transformation, uh, what, what he plays in the film, but I can't. Yeah, it's... it's I, I, it would give too much away. It's a surprise. Okay. But his all I can say is his performance was gold. And Wayne also is a noted art uh, musician, musician yeah. who provided a Music. great track for the film. Yeah. Um, so we're looking forward to people hearing that. Oh, yeah. And then, um, you know, as part of our partnership, I'm going to be sharing some Fiendish films for you to share with your audience. My, uh, first film, Victor Juliet's Director's Cut. I love that film. <laughs> I'm glad. I did. I appreciate that. It was just, a great... Um, the, uh... The two-part short film anthology, uh, Fiendish Films Double Feature, featuring the statement of Randy Carter, or Lovecraftian tale, and a, the zombie film Condition. Also, uh, the Fiendish Films documentary work, The Slaughter in Syracuse 2014, where uh, there's direct, if you're interested in independent films and the people behind them, um, there's a lot of notable underground filmmakers in this. And then the follow-up, Slaughter in Syracuse 2015 documentary, which is three times as big as the first one, three discs over three hours long. So I hope someone in your audience uh, enjoys those. This is a lot of film, and I will definitely figure out exactly how we're going to give this away. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to having a giveaway, so thank you for providing yeah. me with something that I can give to people, which well, isn't going to make my wife yell at me for spending money on the show. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> it, well, as I said, it, we need to support one another. And that's what it's all about. It, it, can't, it cannot be one way. Yes. And I cannot think of a better sentiment to end this interview on. Do you guys agree? I yes. agree. Thank you, gentlemen, for appearing on Geek Pod Blue, and everybody, we'll be back after this. And that was a fantastic interview, wasn't it? I really like talking to those guys. Uh, they certainly had a lot to uh, teach me about filmmaking. And I got to tell you, I am really excited about working with both Fiendish Films and Hewitt Film Films in the future. Uh, so hopefully we'll be having a lot more of those guys uh, going forward. Now it is time for the news segment. Sorry that uh, we didn't do our normal transition. Wasn't quite sure how to handle having guests on. So 
Uh, we're going to get right into the news. Uh, first of all, a lot of TV stuff this week. Um, Fox's The Gifted premiered this past Monday. Uh, the Gifted is uh, a story based in the X-Men universe, but the X-Men are apparently no longer kicking around. It's even referenced in the uh, very first episode that uh, the X-Men and the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants uh, existed, but are not there anymore. They have not revealed uh, exactly what happened to them. Now, I have watched this premiere, and I liked it. It was really good. Um, Stephen Moyer, who's fantastic and everything, uh, puts on a great performance. I'd watch this show just for him. Uh, I think if you guys haven't checked it out, you certainly should. Now, it debuted to 4.8 million viewers, and it built on its lead-in show. So, uh, so far, so good. Uh, posting up big numbers. So it's probably okay for now. We'll have to see if those drop off. In an update to uh, previously talking about ratings for the Orville, this is, and this is specifically for Mike Fitzgerald. Uh, just so you know, Mike, uh, this last week's episode maintained its 1.1 demographic, uh, so it, it looks like it's in good shape. Most outlets are saying if it continues like this, it's probably going to be renewed, uh, only because it's got a cushion in the fact that you know Fox has a great working relationship with Seth MacFarlane, and they're not just going to cancel his show if it's doing okay. So we're probably going to get a lot more Orville to come. Uh, continuing with the TV show stuff, um, apparently Inhumans premiered. Did anyone else catch that? I didn't. I had no idea. I found out on Monday. I was reading the horrible reviews and talking about how the ratings uh, pretty much tanked, and I, there was like zero promotion for this. I mean, I saw lots of promotion for the IMAX premiere, but I had no idea it, that it, it came on. It was on Friday. They moved it to the Friday night death slot. Uh, apparently, they do not have any faith in this show at all. Now, uh, if you guys did watch the show, write in, tell me what you think. Uh, I'm going to try to catch up with it this weekend, but it just kind of blew me away that the premiere of Marvels and Humans came and went, and I didn't even know about it until three days later. That's pretty odd. Further on in the news, uh, there's a lot of very strange, confusing messages being uh, kicked around by movie studios. Uh, first this week... Uh, Jeff Johns said that the DC films were not going to be in a connected universe. And then he came back to clarify that, no, he meant they are going to be in a connected universe, which is funny because that's not what he said the first time. I'm not sure if they're trying to work their way through the quagmire of having an Elseworlds style uh, setup for some of their standalone movies, or if they're just trying to say that, you know, we don't want to be bogged down by continuity. Now, in his... Uh, follow-up, he did say that it, basically they weren't going to have every character in every movie. It's not going to be like a Marvel movie where there's tons of cameos and every movie leads into the next movie. They want them to be self-contained, kind of like Wonder Woman. That doesn't mean they aren't in the same universe, and that doesn't mean that when you see them, like everyone in Justice League, they won't have already had those adventures. They're, it's not a, a new version of Wonder Woman played by the same actress, but they're not going to worry about making sure they lead into Justice League 3 with Wonder Woman 2, or, or something along those lines. At least that's what I'm taking from it. Uh, also, in very similar news, Universal has announced that their Bride of Frankenstein movie is not going to be connected to their Dark Universe. Now, if you recall, they were trying to reboot all the Universal movie monsters, starting with The Mummy, uh, which it kind of fell flat. You know, it did okay overseas, so they're not losing money on it, but it was not the hit that they expected from a Tom Cruise vehicle. So now it seems like they're backpedaling and saying Bride of Frankenstein will not be connected. Now, I have to be honest with you, I think that's a really silly thing to do. Uh, the Mummy didn't flop because it's connected to the Dark Universe. You know, it flopped because of timing, because of other movies that came out. Uh, it may have even flopped because, you know, people really don't like Tom Cruise anymore. I mean, I don't personally have a problem with him, but there are a lot of people who just can't get past his uh, his Scientology, his personal beliefs, and he's been in so many things. I mean, hey, I'm not saying Hollywood shouldn't employ him anymore, but you know, he, he's leaving for Mission Impossible and then go do some indie stuff because, you know, he's not the big box office draw that he used to be. Uh, and I think it's kind of ridiculous to disconnect Bride of Frankenstein from their dark universe when they can just make the movie they don't have to have any cameos. You know, don't disconnect it or connect it. It's there for you to connect to if you want to in the future. But if they purposely film it in a way and write it in a way that breaks it off from that, they cut themselves off from other possible avenues because there were other titles in the Dark Universe that were going to be a lot less expensive to produce that may have done much better and allowed it to continue. So I guess we're just going to have to wait and see. Now, if you guys are excited about the Stranger Things uh, Season 2 premiere, uh, I mean, I know I am. I hope you guys are as well. Uh, today, a Stranger Things game came out for Apple and Android. Now, this is an 8-bit retro title. Uh, features all of the characters, so you can play around. Each of them have different abilities to help you with puzzles. And there's uh, both classic and hardcore 
uh, or normal and classic, I could say. The classic being hardcore, harkening back to uh, the 8-bit era where games were ridiculously freaking hard sometimes. Um, and if you beat the game, I, I don't know what you have to do to do this, but apparently uh, as you approach the premiere, you'll be able to unlock some stuff relating to Season 2. Uh, so certainly if you like Stranger Things, please check that out. Also revealed today, and I found this incredibly interesting, though not surprising, um, The Rock uh, has revealed that his character, Maui, from Disney's Moana, was partially based on his real-life grandfather. Uh, now, if you're a wrestling fan, you would know him as High Chief Peter Maivia. Uh You may not know this, but The Rock comes from a wrestling family, and his grandfather, his father, tons of people in his family have been in the wrestling business. And uh, that certainly, you know, it, it kind of connects it all. It almost makes the character of Maui a little bit more interesting to know. Not only is he voiced by, you know, The Rock, but he's also uh, based on The Rock's grandfather. Now, if you guys have been thinking about picking up one of those VR headsets, there's a ton of them to choose from. HTC has one. Uh, PlayStation has one. Uh, Oculus has one. There's a ton of them. And uh, there is a new uh, bundle that might help you decide which one to go with. Now, if you've been wanting to play Fallout 4 in virtual reality, now is the time to pick up an HTC Vive because the game comes free with every single unit sold. Now, I don't know if the HTC Vive is as powerful as some of the other ones. I, I always thought it was interesting that, you know, I understand why Oculus was doing it. I understand why PlayStation was doing it. When HTC came out and said, we're going to make a, you know, a virtual reality headset, I was a little thrown. Now, I mean, Samsung's a version. I mean, you could say, oh, Samsung's a phone company. They do it. Yeah, theirs is just a thing you throw your, your smartphone in. It doesn't connect up to your PlayStation or your computer and play games in the same way. And I've heard that it's a good unit, uh, and I'm wondering if they're doing this because I, I've got to tell you, if I was going to buy a VR headset, the HTC Vive would not be one of the first ones I was looking at. So maybe they're trying to drum up some sales. Further TV news, uh, found out this week that Fox passed on a Hellfire Club TV show. Uh, based in the X-Men universe. Now, this is when they were kicking around, you know, whether they were going to do The Gifted. Apparently, there was a treatment for a Hellfire Club uh, TV show. Now, if you're not familiar with the Hellfire Club, it is, uh, you know, there, there's lots of the bad mutants. Emma Frost and uh, Shaw, what's his name? Something Shaw. My, my mind is blanking. Uh, but basically, they, they thought it was a good idea, but they decided to back away from it for two reasons. One, it had a huge cast, and the Hellfire Club does have a, a huge cast of characters. The other thing was that none of them were actually the lead. They were all kind of equal in the background, and they felt that a, a show without a strong lead uh, could fail to find viewers. And I, I don't know if I uh, necessarily disagree with their argument. It certainly makes sense to me. I am a little bit sad that we're not going to get to see a version of the Hellfire Club on TV, though, because I think that would have been incredibly interesting. Uh, now, to close things out this week, uh, a lot of bad shit happened this week. It has not been a good week. It's not been a good week in the world, for sure. Um, we lost Tom Petty, you know, from Tom Petty, the Heartbreakers, you know, and then we didn't, and then we lost him again. That was a little confusing. I don't know if you guys were paying attention, but the night they announced that he... Uh, um, went into cardiac arrest first they announced he was dead and then they rolled it back and then they said he wasn't dead and then it wasn't until the wee hours of the morning that uh his uh, manager actually came out and made a statement so for a little while there he was like schrodinger's tom petty both alive and dead at the same time um i certainly know that the rock world is going to miss him uh as a musician myself uh, i can recall playing many of his songs when i was learning to play guitar so you know i, I don't know a guitarist out there who didn't you know one of the first three songs they learned wasn't free falling well, maybe if they're a country guitarist, but you know, a rock guitarist, yeah, Free Falling was probably one of the first three songs you learned. So uh, that's definitely sad. The other big news this week was the, the shooting in Las Vegas. Now, uh, I'm always very careful about how I voice my opinions. Uh, while this show does allow me to have my own platform, I don't want to ostracize anybody or, you know, I don't want to cause anybody to, to have an issue if they like the show for the content I bring. Uh, but I, I feel like I do have to say something. I... First of all, being that, you know, I'm a Democrat, you would think, oh, well, you know, you're probably all for gun control. I am and I am, I'm not. See, the, the reason is I, I don't think you're ever going to take the guns away. Now, whether or not the fact that uh, we have the rights to bear arms is based on a, a misunderstanding of the Second Amendment or not, for over 200 years, it's been the law. And that's not going to change. Um, it's a lot harder to take something away from people than it is to to give something to them. And you can see that right now in the headlines as evidenced by the fact that uh, the Republicans who have the majority of the power have not been able to repeal Obamacare yet. 
uh, it's it's one of those things, you know, it's a lot harder to take something away. And a law and an amendment that has stood around for over 200 years, it's not going to happen. We will be colonizing other planets before you're able to take guns away from Americans. I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm just saying that's the reality of it. Uh, you know, you, when you're, if you're going to have a conversation about something that's polarizing, you have to be realistic about it. And the reality is you're never going to take away guns from everybody. Now, I certainly think that we do need stricter gun laws. I think that there's a lot we could do to make sure that they don't end up in the wrong hands. However, what I'm seeing uh, about this shooting um, so far, I mean, it's, it's a breaking story, so this may change, but I wonder whether or not stricter gun control laws would have even helped in this situation. And, you know, there are situations, you know, a guy with no record, no uh, history of mental health problems, you know, no issues at all, been collecting guns all his life, gets up one day and decides, you know what, fuck it, I'm shooting a bunch of people. Uh, strict gun laws are not going to help that unless you take guns away from everyone. And like I said, that's not going to happen. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't be having a conversation about gun control right now. What I am saying is that we shouldn't be having a conversation about gun control only after something horrible happens. Because whether or not stricter laws could have prevented this or not, this is a conversation we should be having all the time. That's why nothing ever changes and nothing gets done. We only have outrage when something bad happens. Uh, when thing, bad things aren't happening, that doesn't mean the problem goes away. And you know, stricter gun laws might prevent some of the other gun deaths that happen. Not, not the ones in a situation like this where they, they may not have made a difference, but there are a lot of other situations where they would. So I feel if, if you want to make a change in the world and you want to try and get stricter gun regulation, you need to stay on this 24-7, 365, not just after something bad happens. You know, I, I think that in a perfect world, we would find a way to restrict and maybe better ways to keep them out of the hands of people who have known problems or may potentially have an issue, but you can't take them away from people who are, are responsible gun owners. That just isn't going to happen in America. I also wanted to say that I saw a very interesting, uh, I don't know if it was a meme or not, but it was posted up on Twitter. It was a picture. I'm going to paraphrase it, but basically what it said in a nutshell was uh, when a 65-year-old man, oh, actually, before I say that, this was in response to... Um, gun enthusiast saying, well, what about knives kill people? What about stricter knife control? And uh, this person basically said, when a 65-year-old man kills 56 people and injures 500 from 1,200 feet away with a knife, I will absolutely be all in for stricter knife control. Until then, you're making the shittiest point in the world. And I kind of thought that made sense. But hey, that's just my opinion. Your mileage may vary. <music> And that was the sound of the Geek Pop Blue mailbox, and we just learned something, kids. We just learned that an empty mailbox sounds exactly the same as a full one. Now, nobody bothered to get up off their butts and write in this week, so we don't have anything for this segment. But, you know, that, that does kind of uh, put things in perspective, considering I've got all these awesome movies from both Hewitt Films and Fiendish Films to give away, and I'm going to make you guys work for them now. So I'm not exactly what kind of contest we're going to run or how we're going to give these out, but along with your normal questions you should have sent in this week. Next week, I'd like you to tell me what you would do for some of these movies. How far are you willing to go to get some precious gems of local independent filmmaking in your library? You guys think about it and make sure you get back to me before Thursday morning of next week. And that is pretty much going to round up and bring this show to an end. It's been a lot of fun. I want to thank uh, both Brian Hewitt and Michael Allen Fitzgerald uh, for the awesome interview. And want to make sure you guys tune in next week which when hopefully the third story in the news is not about a deeply religious Republican congressman who's always been against abortion telling his mistress to have an abortion. Till then, talk and roll, kids. Geek Pod Blue is a Geek Pod Network production. Executive producers Paul Showens and Hugh Allen. Concept created by Paul Showens and Hugh Allen. Intro is Opportunity by Jameis Breed. Closing is Bucket by Jameis Breed. Both licensed for use by Dennis Johnston. Want to help the show? Leave a five-star rating on iTunes. Geekpod can be reached at contribute at geekpod.com or send us a tweet at geekpod. That's G33KPOD. You can also find Geekpod on Facebook and Instagram. G33KPOD. That's G33KPOD.